Hey, everybody. Thank you for being with me. I have a special guest today. His name is Donald Cohen, and he wrote a very interesting book called The Privatization of Everything, How the Plunder of Public Goods Transformed America and How We Can Fight Back. Donald is a founding board member of the Power Switch Action, formerly the Partnership for Working Families, He's the former political director of the San Diego Imperial County's Labor Council and founder and executive director of the Center on Policy Initiatives, a a San Diego-based think tank and policy organization. He is currently the executive director of an organization called In the Public Interest. He's currently on the board of the Ballot Initiative Strategy Center, and his opinion pieces and articles have appeared in the New York Times, Reuters, the Los Angeles Times, the San Diego Union Tribune, the New York Daily News, the New Republic, and other online and print outlets. Donald, thank you so much for being with me. I appreciate it. Well, thanks so much for having me. I'm a a fan and a follower. (laughs) Well, thank you so much. So, you know, I have this kind of romantic view of American um, democracy, and I'm very clear about how things are supposed to be. And one of the things that's supposed to be a basic core first value is that we have a balance and that the government monitors the balance between individual liberty and a concern for the common good. And part of that individual liberty is, of course, meant to be economic liberty, but economic liberty should never trample upon uh, the common good. So that's the ideal. And I actually grew up thinking that, you know, that tussle and that struggle was pretty healthy in America and that the free market was honored, but we would push back against it if it ever trampled on the rights of children or trampled on the rights of workers or trampled on the rights of, of the earth. And there were regulations and there were um, appropriate measures and there was a healthy labor movement, all these things that would make sure that capitalist forces and Um, uh, the market never became such an overriding behemoth of power as to trample on the rights of everyone else. Well, I'm old enough to remember 40, 50 years ago when all of that began to change. And that, as I understand it, is what your book is about. Am I right? That's absolutely correct. I I couldn't have said it better. Well, you did say it better, actually, but throughout the book. So, but thank you. I just want to make sure I got this right. It's all, okay, is, first of all, please explain. It's all about democracy. That's the point. It's all That's about right. democracy. It's That's all right. about what we have to say over and what private interests have say over, you know, say over and control That's over. Right. And so, and it, and, right. you know, 40 or 50 years ago when, when I was young as well, you know, we counted on public institutions. We, we respected them. We, you know, we, we, we understood that they were there for all of us, um, particularly mm-hmm. after Social mm-hmm. Security passed and Medicare. I mean, excuse me, particularly after Medicare passed, we said we, we understood that. So what's happened in the last 40 years is an assault on democracy. It's a takeover of control of the public essentials that we all need. And before you mentioned Medicare, of course, you mentioned Social Security. Both of those are examples of governmental action that protected the common good. So I remember certainly in, in the 1980s, in the orgiastic efforts of, of, of Reagan and the Reagan administration to deregulate and to demonize government. That's really how it all started, right? Was that almost diabolical notion? Remember Reagan in that very cool way he had of saying government is not the answer, government is the problem. He demonized government. So they created this myth that the only people who knew how to do anything uh, were those who were in control of the market. That's correct. That I mean, correct? there's a little bit of a backstory before that. There were people like Milton Friedman and other conservative economists that were laying the groundwork for the sort of an anti-public and pro-market viewpoint, right? You know, Milton Friedman came up with the idea of school vouchers in the 50s. What Reagan did was he was like the propagandist in chief for, you know, for that world mm-hmm. view. Um, you know, one of the things I talk about a lot is because the use of race is critical to this. And when he talked about welfare queens, that, you know, the, those of us remember, what he was really doing there was saying, government's not only incompetent, but it serves somebody else, not you, and they're undeserving. Mm-hmm. So it's, mm-hmm. it was a sort of a key strategic mm-hmm. approach to separate, you know, people's <clears throat> idea of government serving us all to, well, I guess it's really not for me. I shouldn't pay my, I, why do I need to pay taxes then? 
Two things, um, you were talking about Milton Friedman. Even Milton Friedman said, in order for any of this to be safe, there needs to be a UBI. I, for, I forgot about that. So That's when, right. Yeah. So, I mean, he, he, he recognized that if his ideas were allowed to be unfettered without any compensatory protection uh, for uh, the average citizen, that there would be a problem. But, of course, they were very selective. And, of course, we're reminded also of the Brandeis quote, you can have large amounts of money concentrated in the hands of a few, or you can have democracy. You cannot have both. So really, as you said, this is about an assault on democracy when you make stockholder capitalism really your false god. You you can't have it both ways. Either stockholder capitalism and its bottom line of short-term profit maximization for the corporation is your bottom line, or democracy and universality of opportunity is your bottom yeah, line. Yeah, it is. is and, you know, I often get asked the question, well, isn't the free market, aren't private sector more efficient and, you know, cheaper and better and faster? And why can't the, why can't the market take care of these things? And one of the things I talk about with folks is, you know, there are market things and there are public things. They're different things, right? If you want to... I, if you I wanna, couldn't agree more. You know, if you decide as a public that everyone should have health care, which we should, of course, you, you can't do it without government involvement. You, can, you will have private involvement, but you can't have it without government control. Same thing is true if you want to get a letter to every corner of America for the same price. You can't do that if you put it in the market. You can only do that if the, if we decide to do that together and share the cost and share the burden and share the benefit. Now, in advanced uh, democracies such as European countries, there is this mix of socialist and capitalist endeavor. And many countries, not ours, countries that do not have the high poverty rates that we have, that do not have the high incarceration rates we have, that do have uh, some form of universal um, uh, universal uh, health care have figured out how to work out a profit, a, a proper balance between public and private. Would oh, you agree uh, with absolutely. that? Absolutely. Again, the first thing they've decided is that everybody should have it. And then the second thing is the question of how you, who does it and how you pay for it. Those are the three simple questions. Once you decide everybody has to have it, everybody equally without regard for your ability to pay, um, then it's then it's a mix of payment. You got to use tax money. Maybe you'll use some you know some other money as well. But the bottom line is you got to make things available to all. Those kinds of things. Well, I think that there's a generational thing here, as I as I see it, because starting 40 years ago, and as you said, even before that with Milton Friedman, etc., the propaganda machine began, and the idea of government really you being used to serve the people. You mentioned Medicare. Nobody wants. You know, most Americans don't want to get rid of Medicare, uh, Social Security, which came from the Socialist Party. Most Americans don't want to get rid of Social Security. But what has happened over the last few years that existed before, but which has been successful now, is this idea that any time government does anything to protect the common good, as opposed to allowing the market to be in total control, they call it socialist. And they've been able to scare people with that word socialism. But one of the things that I notice is very interesting about younger people, Donald, is all the young ones who say, what am I supposed to be scared of in socialism? The free college or the free health care? They're not buying it like former generations did. Oh, Have you noticed absolutely. that? Absolutely. It's sort of inspiring because, you know, we, we lived in the period of the Cold War. I mean, the, you know, the McCarthy period, the McCarthyism had a huge impact on American politics and, you know, long past, you know, the 1950s. And, you know, I think we're starting to get away from it as generations grow up and they see, you know, that people want the basics. Everyone knows what a good life is. Young people don't want to be burdened with debt, with college, you know, with student debt. You know, and we used to not be because we realized that, every, that we needed to provide access to higher education for folks. So we had much more public spending to do that. But when you put it in the market, in other words, you make it a commodity and you make people pay for the service. Um, you know, two things. One, it becomes unaffordable. The two is we forget that we're interconnected, that it's not just we want you, my son or daughter to go to college and do well. I actually need everybody to have that opportunity. It makes a better country, better economy, better society, more vibrant democracy. So it's not universality is not just about everyone having something, the things we need. It's about us recognizing that we need all of everyone to have those things as well. 
I read a book called The Gardens of Democracy once, and it talked about how it likened what you're talking about here to what would happen in the human body if all of the blood went into the right arm. <laughs> Was that Nick Hanner? Is that Nick Hanner's book? Blood has I think? to circulate. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Think, I, I'm not sure. I think maybe a couple of guys. Yeah, the idea of what, just like blood has to flow throughout the body, opportunity has to flow throughout the society. It can't just belong to a small group of people, and education is such a perfect example. That's why so many of us are shouting about canceling the college loan debt. Why? Because it should That's never exactly have been right. there. You know, in the 1970s, the average American worker could afford, they had decent benefits, could afford a home, could afford a car, could afford a yearly vacation, could afford to send their kids to college. It was the policies that you talk about in this book that changed right. all that, right? Now, in the book, the, a, a prime example of all this, how a market mentality literally came at the expense of people's lives, was the way the Trump administration handled the COVID uh, crisis, how what he could have done with the, with the uh, National uh, uh, Pro That's Defense right. Production yeah. Act. Uh, yeah. And how we all remember how attorneys general, governors were screaming, let us have access to masks, let us have access to ventilators. And for the, for, for the sake of the market, literally the government let people die. Can you, can you explain how that went down and what an egregious example this is of allowing privatization yeah, well, to run I mean, amok? What Trump said is, you know, we don't need to solve this. The market will come to your rescue. So what that meant, you know, in a practical term, was governors had to compete against other governors other states to buy the stuff, to buy the PPE, the ventilators, access to testing equipment and all of that. And it was and it was an abs obviously an absolute disaster, right? Governors were screaming, lives were being lost because uh, private companies that were right. making the stuff, it was a seller's market. There was price gouging going on as well because of that, because there was opportunity when you, in right. that case. Just to get hand sanitizer. Above. That's exactly were, right. I mean, in even the Trump administration, I don't remember exactly who, um, but they realized that that wasn't working. It created Operation Warp Speed. So, you know, because we needed mm -hmm. private companies to make masks and hand sanitizer and ventilators, but we needed government money to make sure everybody had it because it was, uh, and we needed government coordination mm -hmm. to make sure it was distributed fairly. And we need government action to make sure we were producing enough to get uh, and to get it in everybody's hands. And that's the only way you deal with that. And once again, the only way you can deal with a crisis like that, and I think that this was very eye-opening, Donald, for many people, because I think it was COVID that really showed people the heartlessness, the soullessness, really the sociopathology of an economic system that not only does not see its purpose as serving the society, but quite the opposite, as you said, has no problem with hurting the society. Because if you if you tell people to drop dead, you are hurting the society. If your if your basic tenet is that in order to increase our profits, you will not only be exploited, but you will be allowed to die if that is what is necessary. I mean, the shadow side of that form of capitalism became very became very obvious to many, many people, I think, including mm -hmm. our young. Yeah, Am absolutely. I correct on that? One of the things I think is important to understand about corporations and business is that they only do one thing. They sell stuff. That's it. And what do they care about? What do they measure? They care about how many they sell, how much it, how much they charge for it, what it costs to produce or, or, or do, what their uh, profit share is, um, what their market share is, and how, you know, what's their returns to investors. That's it. So maybe there there are times when that's you know our interests are aligned because we want the stuff you know we want to buy the stuff in the market or whatever consumer product, but there are times when that apps that single focus that's all they do, completely clashes with us, complete with with public purpose and the common good, and that's an example. Unless you have government that sets standards, with you know cops on the beat you know to make sure you know enforcers to make sure it's happening then businesses are going to do what businesses do, sell stuff and charge as much as they can. That's the balance we need to get back to, right? Where they're, they're not in charge. Well, well, once the Supreme Court said that money is free speech, and then with Citizens United, those same corporations have such undue influence on Congress and apparently the yeah. White House as well, that it, it, it is, uh, as you make very clear in the book, it's destroying our yeah, democracy. Well, it's, you know, if, you, if, if you look at the so core, as, and I think we would probably agree, is the concentration of wealth and power 
is at the core of much of what we are dealing with today in many issues, right? In anything we care, right? Oh, there, you Absolutely. know, climate inequality, democ- you know, assault on on voting rights and democracy. It's because those with the the capital, the cash, and therefore the political and economic power are in charge, and that's what we have to do. We have to unpeel that, uh, and you know, sort of chip away at it and take it back. Well, that's the core problem, clearly, and that's why it has been, you know, it's not just an opinion. Basically, it's a fact. We're not functioning as a democracy. We're functioning as an oligarchy because even our democracy, given corporate power over both major political parties. um, um, All right, so I want to go to the part of your subtitle which says, and how to fix it. Okay, so let me, if I could, give an example of how privatization on, on a concrete way takes away mm-hmm. democracy. I'm going to bring it down to the ground a little bit because I think that'll help. Okay. So the example I want to give okay. is, uh, is um, and I could give many, so um, there, um, is Chicago parking meters. Um, in 2008 and 2009, you know, the worst of the Great Recession, cities and local governments and state governments were bleeding red ink. It was a really desperate time fiscally for, for local and state governments. So what happened is on a Friday, the mayor, Daly at the time, announced a proposal from three uh, corporations, Morgan Stanley, Wall Street, a a sovereign wealth fund from the Middle East, one of the countries in the Middle East, and a national parking company. They said they'll give the city $1.1 billion up front in exchange for the city control of the city's 36,000 parking meters for 75 years. Vote on Tuesday. They vote. Desperate government, desperate times, all sorts of reasons. They take the deal. Okay, that's 2083 we're talking about. Incredibly stupid way to borrow money on your future income. We all do that when we buy a house. You know, we don't know if we're going to be driving then. Um, But here's the problem where it gets to democracy. If the city wants to eliminate parking spots temporarily for a street fair, but more importantly, um, won't be yeah, or to. more for bus rapid transit, dedicated bus lanes, bike lanes, or uh, pedestrian malls to change land use patterns in a city. They have to buy the spots back at the future value of the spot. Okay, so you have an elected leadership of the city, city council, mayor, who's you know city city governments. They do land use, housing, transportation, climate. They, these are their job. That's their job. Their hands are tied. Um, so completely. And you see that in contracts of all kinds. Prison contracts have bed guarantees in them. Keep the beds filled or pay anyway. I mean, so we could go down the list of all sorts of things. So I wanted to give that context because um, as we go to the what to do about it, um, because there's a few things I think are important to do. There's a there's a short, there's a long, a medium, and a short-term answer to this. First, as long as we have to recognize they played the long game. Moving these ideas that the market's the answer and government, you know, the problem. (coughs) Well, I think we're living at a point, people realize you have one out of four Americans who cannot afford to fulfill the prescriptions that their doctors give them. It's, It's bad enough that people are uninsured or underinsured in terms of health care. But now you've got people who, even if they are insured often, still cannot afford to fulfill the prescriptions. People understand that they're, people are rationing their insulin. People understand that insulin costs in other countries a fraction of what it costs here. And also diabetes is a main pre-existing condition that makes people vulnerable to COVID. A lot of our COVID deaths happened because of people who had um, diabetes at such a higher level as we have higher level of chronic illness and other, of other chronic illnesses as well. So it's interesting what you're saying because I think that life is showing yeah. this to people. We, we have not been successful at, at pushing back against the diabolical messaging, but life is making it clear now. People eyes are, people's eyes are being open. Is nobody helping me here? Do we not have a government? Do I pay taxes? What's going on here? Uh, is that your I, impression I think so. as well, I, mean, I Donald? think, you know, COVID has shown that there's a real battleground. This is battleground territory, right? Right. In terms of the, you know, the anti-mask mm-hmm. and stay out of my business and anti-vax and, and those, and those, I think really the majority that understand that the health of all of us depends on the health of each of us. I think that you know, that, I think that's sort of the the battle that plays out in America today. But I do think that people want 
know what a good life is. They know what they need. They don't think they should be paying for health care. They don't think they, they should have access to municipal broadband, you know, to broadband now, to whether it's municipal or whatever. They should, they want to get to college to, you know, to have a better life in a better country. So there is an opening to have those discussions. Power is, and is in the way. Then the question is, is how do we push back on that? You know, and I think that, and it is happening. Right, okay. water systems are, around the country are being remunicipalized. Cities are voting to have uh, municipal broadband because they say we don't want to give it to the telecoms. We want public institutions to have that. I mean, so I think, and then as you mentioned, young people are, you know, the socialism stuff doesn't make you know the socialism attack doesn't make sense to them. These are basic things um, that we should all have. When you talk about water being remunicipalized, <laughs> Municipal, re <laughs> municipalized. Um, I don't know if you've read Dennis Kucinich's book uh, or know his story about when he was mayor of Cleveland and he fought so hard uh, uh, to, to keep the electrical system away from uh, private hands. And now, and he was, he was just, he, he was practically destroyed because of it. And now he has been so vindicated because people are realizing exactly yeah. what you said. So what do we do, Donald? Three you levels. said there, there's the big well, picture, well, it's the, the medium long picture, term, and the short picture. Short, medium term, and short term. So me, long term, is we have to remember, this was a long game for them. So it's got to be a long game for us. If we're going to rebuild That's commitment right. to the idea of public, that there are things that we can only do if we do them together, and government is our institution, we, gotta, we need a drumbeat like they had a drumbeat. That includes, talk, and that includes right. talking about the good stuff. There's public things all around us. Okay, I want you to slow down because okay. I really want to get this. This is really important. We can rebuild commitment to the very idea of the public good, the idea that some things must be done together. And you said point out the positives. Social Security, right? right. Medicare. Um, okay. okay, keep going. The, I'm listening. You turn on the tap, the water comes out. You flush the toilet, the water goes away. <laughs> um, it's kind of a miracle, I think. The paint on, the, on all of our walls used to have lead in it. But it was public action that you know that regulated lead out of our gasoline and our um, you know and our and the paint on our walls. There's a history, a hundred years, of progressively good law. The minimum wage established it needs to go up and all that, uh, but it's happening. Child labor Child laws. Labor laws. Um, minimum wage in cities and states around the country are you know are f far surpassing the the federal government. I mean, the, um, our our um, pharmaceuticals. Drugs. I mean, there's lots of there's lots of work to yet to be done, but you know, the pharmaceutical industry fought uh, having to um, disclose side effects. <laughs> you know, for many years, um, the food companies fought for many years ha having the nutrition label on the side of the box. They didn't want to tell people what it was. I mean, there is a hundred years of economic, social, environmental. Um, worker safety law, and, and, and many other things that have actually made progress forward. Our cars, the, the steering wheels in our cars used to impale people on impact. They don't do that because of Ralph Nader and, you know, the, the auto safety movement, seatbelts, seat airbags, the Clean Air Act. I, I, you know, I live in Los Angeles. The air is cleaner than it was 40 years ago. Now, is there more to do? Absolutely. Yeah, even with water, I, uh, Aaron Brockovich's latest book makes it clear that the water is so much worse than people have any idea and all over this country because it's invisible. It's not, not every place is like Flint, not that that's yeah. not horrifying, but people could see that the water is brown. A lot of us are drinking now the talk about that's the right. PFAS in the water everywhere, et cetera, and you don't even know, you don't have, even have any indication. And uh, so many of us saw the movie, Erin Brockovich, and she says, actually, it's much worse than it That's was right. in that PG. And, and, uh, and let me, let me make a point about it. You said invisible. So there's two points. on it. One is, I think the, the idea of public being around is both invisible yet ubiquitous. It's all around us. And so part of it, in my, in my book, I say we need to surface the state, right, that around us, the state in concept um, around us. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, well, you know, we have a tendency to, to talk about because we want to fix things, right? We want to fix the water. We, you know, I, work, I help camp. We, we, my organization, we work on campaigns and with groups to help eliminate PFAS from water. But we have to figure out how to talk about what's needed to be done while recognizing the progress, 
become the reformers, learn how to critique government action without undermining the idea of public. That's our task as progressives who want to you know, rebuild the commitment to the common good and things we do together. So that's part of the long game. The other part of the long game is, you know, we've got to chip away at the, the private market can do everything better. Profit motive is the way to go, you know, is what the, is the engine of progress and innovation. We have to chip away at that stuff. I'll go to the medium term. The medium term is, you know, is, is law and practice is we we don't do everything. There's public and private in all public things. We don't build the roads. We don't, you know, but we but the roads are ours. Our job is to set high standards, economic standards, environmental standards, quality standards, public the standards that will deliver on the public purpose of those things. The roads are about mobility. That's the public good. So mm-hmm. we set standards and we make sure there's cops on the beat. Because if there's not cops on the beat, in other words, enforcers and all the monitors, then it's then it's not really a standard. And you could do that at every level of government. In educa- we work on issues like this in education, in infrastructure, and all that. And that's what people can do and be engaged in their community at their state level and certainly at the federal level. And really important to do. The third level, the short term, and I say this more for people that might be listening, is people be aware. When they see a privatization proposal coming, um, you know, start asking questions. You know, they can reach out to us as well and all that, because often these things happen because it's a contract or it's they're not paying attention to the new water system being built and all that. If you pay attention, if you pay attention exactly. and you look around you, what might be built, what 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 the needs are and what the, the local process is to make that happen. If you see it, it's probably already be happening for six months or a year. And then That's reach exactly out. Exactly right. And, and we'll be happy to help. And there's organizations around the country that can help get, arm citizen activists and advocates with the tools to engage in how to make their communities better. And at the local level, at the at school boards and cities, at the state, of course, at the federal level. You know, I think part of the problem is that Americans haven't traveled mm-hmm. as much as have citizens in other countries. So, for instance, the average American has no clue how much more the government does for the citizens of most European, advanced European countries. They have no idea how much better their airports are, how much better, how <laughs> faster their trains are, how much better uh, and, and, and more available their health care is, how much more available um, uh, uh, child services are. Uh, Pre-K, universal pre-K, paid leave after children are born, child care. So many times people, you see it online, people go over to live for a year or so or go to school for a year or so in a European country and their minds are blown because they don't really know how deprived we are here and how over these decades Americans have been trained to expect No, you're absolutely right. It's another key point is we have to expand the realm of the possibility that isn't dreaming. It's yeah. like it's real out there. I spent a, uh, a weekend in the fall in Toronto with some friends um, that I hadn't seen in quite some time. And I was asking about health care. Right. It's a single payer system. We, we, we know that. I, and I was asking dumb American questions. So how much do you pay? What you know, what do you do? What's your you know, copay or whatever the question was? And they looked at me like I didn't know what I was talking about. No, we, we just go to the doctor. <laughs> we don't pay <laughs> to go to the doctor. Everyone needs to go to the doctor. So from the outside, I can only imagine looking in how crazy it looks. A, a Canadian did say to me something that was interesting about, he said, you know, once you're really sick, it's better in Canada. But if you just suspect that you're sick and you want your doctor to give you a test because you suspect something, you're better off the United States. But that would have to do with compensatory insurance, of course, that you could still, even under Medicare, be able to, um, to yeah. purchase. Is that well, correct? I, you know, I don't I have enough so. experience in Canada, but I think essentially it's because we can buy care, right? And so that's a stratified reality, right? That's true for those who can afford it. Right, who have that level of insurance, who right. have access if they don't have insurance, whatever. So it's you know when you equalize things, yeah, you got you might have to wait online a little bit. Most people don't in, in Canada compared to what the you know the 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 bureauc- you know the the opponents say. But you have to realize that once you're all in it together, then two things: you it means you got to share, but the other thing means you're in it together to fix it too. Our system, you're not. We're not in it together to fix it because we don't. We're. It's just. It's a consumer product. We buy our health care through our insurance, but if it. But until you're in Medicare, Medicare, which I now am, 
then it's okay. I want uh, me wanting to get better healthcare means I have to do it with other people because it's all or not. It's all or nothing with Medicare. One of the um, one of the Build Back Better elements that it's so sad that we lost was the idea that the government should be able to negotiate with pharmaceutical companies for uh, lower drug prices. It is absolutely outrageous that the government actually surrendered that. The government actually surrendered to big pharmaceutical companies the ability to negotiate uh, for lower drug prices. It's um, We have and, just and, acquiesced. Know, and that's why I think... So... No, that's what, part of the answer to what what the pro- <laughs> how to fix it is. We have to use all of the powers of government to put the public back in control of those basic things, right? Governments spend tr- in America, governments from school boards to the federal government spend two trillion dollars a year in buying stuff from you know from bombers to paper clips to outsourcing water systems, everything in between. That's an enormous amount of power, right? And, and, and in, obviously in healthcare and all the above, we set standards. We decide what you know what happens and what doesn't happen. We you know the 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 failure to use our negotiating power is a crime in pharmaceuticals. Yeah. Well, I think you're calling it a crime is accurate. It is a crime. It's a, certainly a crime against our democracy. So, do you have hope? Uh, you know, some days, um, you know, these are crazy times we've lived, we've been living with. But I think here's the things that give me hope. Um, in, you know, because we work mostly around, my work is mostly around the country in cities and states and all that, occasionally federally. I mean, we, you know, the infrastructure bill that was passed by the Biden administration has got a lot of good stuff in it. It's a good thing. There's, um, so there are, you know, the, the, uh, the National Labor Relations Board. I mean, there's actually good things that are happening in the Biden administration that aren't hitting the news. That yeah. are, it mm-hmm. matters who runs yeah. it. And who's in the administration? Yeah, and antitrust. Exactly. Lena Khan. And I have friends yeah. at at OIRA, at, within the OMB, which is OIRA is one of the most important you know uh, agencies in the federal government when it comes to the regulatory powers of the, of the of the government. But here's the other thing that gives me hope is so when I mentioned water systems coming back in house, you know, to around the country, that's happened not because just you know someone it happened on its own. It happened because there are people in motion making it happen. And it happened for two. It happens on water for two reasons. One of which is it, it turns out it can be done cheaper in house, which you know sort of we could have told you that. But the other is people think it's even whether it's not cheaper or not. They think they realize it's ours. And they want control over it, right? They think it should be ours. That's right. There are there is a a law in um, the, cities trying to do municipal broadband around the country have are being blocked by big telecom going to state legislatures and prohibiting from mm. you know cities from doing that uh, preemption laws they did that in this in Colorado but they left a little loophole uh, i call it a pro public loophole but that wasn't their intent that if cities in Colorado wanted to do municipal broadband they would have to take it to the voters every city that did it it was passed overwhelmingly by huge margins so exactly. what that says to me is Two things: people get people it; they get know it, what yeah. they want. They understand. They don't like their. T- they, they've sort of gotten clear about private sector. None of us are happy with our internet companies. So, you, if that's efficiency, I'll take the government any day, right? <laughs> so you can sort of get you know you get to sort of both sides of that debate. So we see all sorts of private prisons that are closed down by people in motion. Nothing happens. Nothing has mm-hmm. happened in America without people in motion making it happen. And I see a lot of that happening around the country. Well, people have been told for so long that the problem is big government, and people are realizing how often the problem is big corporations. Big corporations. It's been a shrunk government and big corporations. And and also with what you're saying, though, it's so problematical because the consciousness of the American people, I agree with you, is rising on these things. But I think the consciousness of the American people has been rising on a lot of things for a long time. The problem is the obstructions within our political system, particularly our political parties, that make the will of the people harder to express um, because of the suppression of the kind of voices that stand for the kinds of things that you and I are talking about. And that's a real problem. We used to have one major political party that 50 years ago would have been associated with the kinds of things that you and I are talking about. And now seeks to suppress within its own ranks uh, people saying what you and I are talking about. And 
I don't have a, I, I don't have a quest, you know, a doubt in my mind. The American people would go with where you and I are going and talking about because all we're talking about is rebalancing something that has been completely unbalanced. We're not talking about getting rid of capitalism. We're not talking about getting rid of of the free market. What we're saying is making it a free market because it's not now a business model based on a free market. It's a business model based on on um, exploitation. And this does not, I mean, some people say get rid of capitalism entirely. I don't know how you feel. To me, you know, there is such a thing as appropriately regulated capitalism, but unfettered capitalism is, uh, unregulated capitalism has become yeah, a no, scourge, not just in our country, but no, in other think, parts I, of the I, world. I completely agree with you. It's not about, I mean, we have to get clear about what the role of government is, the role of markets, the role of individuals in, in society. Right now, it's, you're right. right, it's completely un, uh, unbalanced. Completely what unbalanced. I'll, even what I'll say to the, you know, to, to the obstacles, there's only one answer to the obstacles. It's not an easy one, and that's organizing political power um, by people, you know, taking on the big, you know, big corporations in school board races and congressional races and city council races and state legislatures. There's right. only one way to do it. You know, right. the, 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 the attack on the labor movement has had a real impact on that because, um, you know, labor plays in politics, but there's a more important thing. When people, most of us are not connected to organizations, civic organizations, or where, we, where it's part of our identity, and it's part, we're on that team, on that club. It's not the parties. The party didn't, haven't played that role in a long time. But unions, um, you know, people see themselves as a union member. They know what, you know, it's not that they just take, you know, they do what the union says, but they're part of a community that, under, that understands their interests and fights for their interests together. And we need more organiz We need bigger unions, more people under collective bargaining. But we also need more people in civic and political organizations that see their interests together and figure out together how to fight for them. Well, part of the corporatist agenda, of course, has been demonizing unions and union busting. But there does seem to be a resurgence. There's a reemergence of interest in, in labor among young people, which is very, very good to see. But also, a, a lot of people, you know, I was doing part of this event last night promoting progressive congressional candidates, and a lot of people on the left have started demonizing electoralism, acting like there's no point, and that's not the answer. Oh, my God, that's yeah, not yeah. the answer, because if we don't make one of our efforts electing people who understand this, then these policies it's, will yeah, never it's, be I changed. mean, that was a feature of the 80s, I remember, and then, you know, in the sort of movements, and it yeah. is coming back, and there's a basic fact that everything those people want that we think in terms of their, uh, in ter you know, active people and those people that are, you know, rejecting electoralism, Everything we want requ requires government to take action. Okay, so Absolutely. if you don't want to take over government to be able to make the decisions to do that, how will you ever get there? Th there is no movement in the world, right. progressive movement, uh, you know, social democratic movement or progressive or movement in the world that doesn't see at its center the need to take over and control government to advance their agenda we are this is america this is a, a, a tragic form of american exceptionalism on the progressive side mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i agree with you entirely well i think your book spells out for people what the problem is and i think part of the problem is that people haven't been connecting the dots the propaganda has been so successful at demonizing government at making people feel that trickle-down economics would actually serve them making people feel like any service of the common good is socialism it's a bugaboo it will take away their freedom when in fact it's this huge behemoth power of corporations that has taken away people's freedom and will continue to do so if we don't appropriately push back and also so, as you mentioned, people have pushed back throughout our history. We need, like you were talking about what we need, we need a Teddy Roosevelt right now. You know, we need somebody, we need a president, or we need, even his, his nephew, we need Franklin Roosevelt, who's going who's gonna to be speaking for the people and pushing back against um, overreach uh, by economic forces that actually work in contradiction uh, to yeah. the will and, of the and people. Rem and well, thank you I was going to say, very, remember, very, you know, this is a yeah, long, this on. is historical, but... Seneca Falls happened in 1848, I believe. The women got together to say they wanted the right to vote, mm -hmm. and it happened in 1920, right? Things take, mm -hmm. again, it's because people in motion 
who have the long view, who don't give up, I mean, and, and, you know, and think together, um, that's how change happens. That's the only way. You know, what you're saying is, is a very important thing because we have a lot of younger people particularly who have been acculturated to instant gratification. They're used to 30-minute sitcoms where basically you get what you want by the end of 30 minutes. And, and I point out so often what you said. These things take a long time. Abolition took a long time. Women's suffrage took a long time. Desegregation took a long time. That's not to... Uh, to minimize the importance of a sense of urgency, because a sense of urgency is necessary, but it can't be so easily converted into just hopelessness, what's the point, burn it all down, if we don't get what we want every time there's an election cycle. And I do understand the, the frustration people feel. I feel it too. I'm sure you feel it too. But we, that, that must not um, be used um, as an excuse to take our eye off the electoral ball because it did take a constitutional amendment as well as a war, obviously, to abolish slavery. It did take a constitutional amendment to give women the right to vote. It did take the Voting Rights Act to give black people the right to vote. It did take the Civil Rights uh, Act to dismantle segregation, and those were governmental exactly powers. Right. Exactly right. Yeah, there's only one way forward. Is no, there anything I, else you'd I, like I, to? I'd like to. This is a fascinating say? conversation. I'd like to continue for a few more hours. It's really fun. Um, but no, this is it's. Yeah, well, it's, I hope um, that no, we this will. is you're exactly right. And I think um, you know we've got to convince people that it's it's the long effort, the big things, and part of the reason it the primary reason it, it takes a long time is because there's lots of forces that don't want it to happen. So That's right. it's there are opponents. We are in a, a battle, a democratic battle, small d, but you know, with, with the deck stacked against us, but that's the battle. They're not going to, they're not, you know, businesses want power. They're never going to not want power, corporate, corporate America. The only thing that happens is we need it too, to, so that we can at least negotiate and at some point get control in the right way. So that it's a fair, a fair fight um, against what, Thomas Jefferson called the general tendency of the rich to prey upon the poor. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Okay, well, we're in it. You are clearly in it, and your book is so important. Once again, everyone, it's called The Privatization of Everything. And, you know, Gandhi always talked about how in order to be the political activist, you need to be, you need to educate yourself, to know what the issues are, to be able to articulate the argument. And that's why this book, The Privatization of Everything, I highly recommend that you read it. It's going to give you tools. It's going to give you facts. It's going to give you statistics that enable you to push back against the bullshit when somebody throws it at you. Okay. Donald Cohen, thank you very, very much. It was, yeah, an it was honor a pleasure and an honor for me as well. Thanks so much, Marianne. Thank you.